To me, jazz is freedom. When you have a jazz solo, you have these chords that are, you don't even have to stick to those though. You really have complete freedom in your life and you can do anything. On the stage, I really become a different person and I really feel like I'm really valuable and you know, I've, I've, I'm validated on the stage. Everywhere else I don't care about, you know, it's, but I feel natural there and like I'm doing something worthwhile. Everything else is just preparing to go on the stage. He's one of the last cats standing from that time. He understands the show business of it all. Jack has the ability to, to make me weep when he plays a ballad. This guy is one of the all-time characters and a great trumpet player. And to me, he, you know, Jack is always going to be, you know, the Hollywood legendary trumpet player. I, I you know, I feel sorry for people that don't know this, this talent. I think of Jack as kind of a jazz mystic. And the notes, he just pulls the notes to him and swims right through them with ease. I've never seen such a, such a tragic life for a guy that walks onto a stage and just buries the audience in laughter. I mean, I don't think there's a note I play when I'm trying to play a ballad. I'm trying to think like, well, how would Jack Sheldon play this? To play that brilliantly and to have that comedic sense that he has, this is a heck of a guy, man. I think the year might have been 1953, 1954. It's a Sunday afternoon at Zardy's. The place is crowded and we're all, you know, in those days you wore suit and tie to buy the newspaper. So we all had suits and ties on. Jack came in with a big Hawaiian shirt and uh, swimming trunks and uh, like thongs on his feet. He'd just come from the beach. His hair was perfectly bleached by the sun. He was like a he was like a golden surfer boy, and he was carrying a trumpet. Just walked in out of the surf, came up on the bandstand and played with us. i never forget it. I said, who's that guy? Somebody said, that's Jack Sheldon. I had some records and I wanted to know who that was. And I said, that's Jack Sheldon. He's like a Chet Baker type player, but he doesn't sound like Chet. Sheldon uh, was brought to my attention by uh, Stan Levy. Of course, when I finally met him, I realized I was talking to a crazy person. I first met Jack uh, when I had my show at the Little Theater off Times Square on 44th Street. And Jack was out promoting Run Buddy Run, his uh, CBS series that he starred in. And it, he was running and ran right off the network. Well, I first met Jackson when I first moved out to California in 1957. I think that's the first time I maybe played with Jack was at Donnie's one night when his regular piano player couldn't make it, who I believe was Dave Frischberg. I don't remember who called me for the gig, but somebody said, Jack Sheldon wants you to work with him. And We had to play in a ballpark in Phoenix, Arizona first and then somewhere else. And at the end of the gig, I found my car had been towed away and impounded. And all of a sudden, Jack Sheldon, part fell off the thing, on, I fell on the floor, so he got off the stage, jumped on the floor, now he's playing it from the floor, and it kept blowing, and as he kept blowing, he kept following it out, and keep playing the part. He was completely out in center field when I gave my cut off. A half a mile away from the band, but he followed that part out, but then I knew he was out there and he belonged in that band. It was a terrible hassle to get my car back, so I'll never forget my first Sheldon gig. Uh, as it turned out, uh, it was, it was quite uh, representative of all the gigs that followed. This joint is jumping. It's really jumping. Come on, cats, check your hats. I mean, this joint is jumping. Piano's thumping. 
dancers bumping. This here spot is more than hot. In fact, the joint is jumping. Check your weapons at the door. Be sure to pay your quarter. Burn your leather on the floor. Grab anybody's daughter. The roof is rocking. The neighbor's knocking. We're all bumped when the wagon comes. I mean, this joint is jumping. This joint is jumping. It's really jumping. We're all bumped when the wagon comes. I mean, this joint is jumping. I found Jack Sheldon in a great jazz club in North Hollywood that's now a parking lot. Uh, it was called Dante's. And I walked in one night, and he was right in the middle of a soliloquy from Hamlet from the stage. And I thought, is this a jazz club? Where am I? To be, to be or not to be? To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and hills of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. To die to sleep like there's a rub for what dreams may come this when we're sleeping in this mortal shuffle off. <laughs> Must give us pause. The pause that refreshes is a Coke. So we became friends that night and we've been close friends ever since. He's my hero. Well, he was part of the great jazz movement of California, the California jazz and uh, became the star of that. California cool. To come to California was heaven. California cool. It's hot as blazes all day long. The night is like a song. California cool. I've been all over the world traveling, and uh, it's, it's just the best. It's got everything. California cool. What made the West Coast people different from the East Coast people was just the slower pace. I remember going to the Green Mill and saying, can we play here this afternoon? You know, and they'd say, all right, but don't bother anybody. So and I think that's maybe why Chetty and I played so soft, because we'd go in and we didn't want to bother anybody and we want to keep playing. We got movie stars and four-wheel drive cars. All I need is you. You can hear Jack Sheldon play one note. He just has to go boop, boop. And you know it's Jack Sheldon. You can tell by his sound, by his articulation, by the fluffiness of his tone. Very haunting and, you know, definitely draws you in. Very intimate sounding. I mean, I started playing all over the place and we had bands. And Chet Baker and I were together and we were going all over playing and working. We didn't work that much then, but uh, we were playing a lot. I wanted to be West Coast and feeling it, so I purposely put musicians in unusual places and healthy places and sunshine and palm trees and orange trees and all that. That sort of gave a name to West Coast Jazz, visually anyway. There's this whole misconception, I think, about West Coast Jazz as being a little bit sterile and aseptic, you know, but, but Jack plays with so much feeling. Because a guy lives in California, they call it West Coast Jazz. He's much more than that. I feel like L.A. is my town, you know, I love L.A. He was perfectly at home in Hollywood because his mother was in the business of training babies to swim. She, of course, owned and ran the Gen Loving Swim School on Hollywood Boulevard. And Jack even taught there when he could get into a bathing suit. And I'm a swimming teacher, like she was. We taught together, and very funny. She was funny. And uh, I think I learned everything from her, because that's what I do. I'm a swimming teacher. Now we're at poolside at Jen Lovin' Swim School here on Hollywood Boulevard for the annual swim meet. What's the reaction of these tiny, tiny babies? Are any of them af really afraid? No, nobody has any fear at that age at all. You only get the fear later when the parents talk a lot about it or maybe a child falls in the pool, but nobody is born with a fear. 
She taught my daughter, Julie, who swam when she was nine months old. She was in Life magazine. Here's one champion, and what's your name, honey? Julie Sheldon. And do you know how long you've been swimming? I have all of my life. Jack's a diver. He swims too, but he was a diver, champion diver. He just always liked the water, I guess. And I thought, you know, to get money to be, so I'd be able to play, I'd go out and play at night and then I'd teach in the daytime. I remember my dad telling me that Dave Cavanaugh had called him into his office at Capitol and said, there's this kid that's, uh, you know, at a swimming school around the corner on Hollywood Boulevard where his mom ran a swimming school, Jack's mom. And go check him out. We hear he's pretty good. California cool. And me too. We got earthquakes and rattlesnakes and milkshakes and heartbreaks and everything that's good. Sausalito, San Francisco, Venice Beach, Palace Verdes. We got everything. We got girls. We got beach girls with little tiny curls. I love California. It's so Jacksonville, Florida at the St. Vincent's Hospital. I named myself Jack right away when I was about two years old or something. I think it's from Jack Armstrong. I used to love Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. My mother was following my father, trying to find out where he was. His mother uh, spent years tailing this guy across the country and was never able to run him down. This guy just disappeared into thin air. He moved to Bay City, Michigan. So we moved to Saginaw, Michigan, and got a place on Cherry Street. Then I went to, got a scholarship to Cranbrook, school for boys, just boys. My mother brought home The Sugar Blues by Clyde McCoy. So that was my first hearing the trumpet, and I loved that Sugar Blues, you know, and with the wow on mute. So, and we didn't have any money, so I, I got Tinker Toys, uh, Tinker Toys, I think, when I built myself a little trumpet and I would be always just going doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, outside the YMCA where I was swimming all the time. But the trumpet, I, uh, I liked the trumpet, I always liked it. I think mainly because of Harry James. He was such a dashing figure, you know. I thought, this, this is for me. Maybe I saw him in a movie where uh, with Dick Haynes and he plays, Do You Love Me, Do You Love Me, Do You Love Me, Do You Love Me? I don't know the name of the movie. But anyway, he lost out. And I think Maureen O'Hara was the girl, and he lost the girl to Dick Haynes, but he had a lead part, Harry James. And then at the end of the movie, they, the cab came up with Betty Grable. I don't want any part of her. I'm through with women for life. Oh, now, don't be hasty, boss. You might change your mind. Take a look. Hello. I had a teacher, he was the band leader, and then he let me play with the band, you know, getting an idea of music. But I really learned to read when I moved back to Jacksonville, Florida, which was a year after I went to Cranbrook. So I had a talent for it right away. I was playing with a white band, uh, Sonny Powell's band, and all white kids. And they could play good, but after the job, we played at a prom in Gainesville, Florida. And I went out and there was this black drummer and he had his drums were taped up with electrical tape or something, you know, just a bunch of, and, but he played so good and so different, something, some kind of grease, you know, had some kind of stuff that the white guys didn't have. Talk about prejudice. I was playing in a black theater with a, a black band and 
The cops came up the aisle and took me off the stage and took me to jail. And they uh, put me in a cell, you know, and I, the guy said, I don't think you're any better than those guys. And I said, well, I'm not nearly as good as them. I just started. So I went first with Stan Kenton. We went to New York and I played Birdland and played all over and I was with Stan for four months. Sam Kitten had the record of sidemen suicides. Frank Rosalino shot himself. Ann Richards shot herself. Bud Brisboy shot himself. Art Pepper kept shooting himself over and over again. I love Benny Goodman. I learned everything from Benny. You know, he was a guy that really made it happen. Would you help me out with some of the fellas? Benny? I'd be glad to, uh, Perry. First of all, we have Johnny Markham at the drums. I went in and started working with him, a little band with uh, Flip Phillips and Bill Harris and Benny Goodman and Red Norvo. Jack Sheldon at the uh, pumper. And he would stop and he would tell me, now Jack, sing it out. And play. I don't know what he meant, you know, and I'd try to play like Harry James or any of the guys that had worked with him. And he finally said to me, you know, you could learn a lot from me. And at the time, I thought, what the this guy. You know, we used to say how good the band would be without Benny Goodman, because we were all beboppers. But he was so right. At the time, I didn't believe him, you know, and I'm sure that there's a heaven that he's up there thinking, <laughs> Finally, we were recording in New York, and he stopped the take, and he said, who invented that style you're playing? I said, I did. You like it? And then he laughed. Everybody laughed. And then he never bothered me again. He was just like my father. Jack approaches music his own way. He approaches the trumpet his own way. At least it seems that way to me. I'm not a brass player, but I've never heard anyone get a sound like that. It's, it's full of drama, and it's full of this uh, beautiful kind of a cloudy, kind of a fuzzy, cloudy sound that he gets that nobody else gets, and it's a real mood that he can set with that. He plays probably the most romantic line on trumpet of uh, any I've ever heard. Uh, well, I, I wanted to make my own sound. I wanted to have a better sound than anybody else. The trumpet is the lead, so you it, it really is the boss of the whole thing. You have the melody, and you have the, the uh, loudest part, you know, and the highest, and the uh, what I think is the most important. You know. get a personality about it, you know, the trumpet player's greeting is, hi, I'm better than you. Many people can walk up to a piano and they can play one note. You can strike a middle C. Anyone can do that. A child can do that. But if I hand you this trumpet, it would take you months and months and months just to get out one note. And the average person, when they see, you know, Jack on television in a role that is very show business, they don't really realize the energy and the effort that has taken him on his trumpet to get to that point, to have those doors open to the show business aspect come out. That's just a, a, an added bonus. And people just don't realize how difficult it is to play, you know. A lot of musicians bore me, okay? You know, they're, they're great, you know, but a lot of them bore me. Not, not Sheldon. Whether consciously or not, he's thinking of He's doing things that, that constantly surprise the listener. You have to be a spontaneous composer. Take a song, you learn those chords, then you play the melody to the song, you expand that and, and make your own melodies to those chords. And you can go outside the chords or inside, and the more you know those chords, it frees you up, and then you're not limited by your technique. And that's what jazz is. He really has a great technique, but that he puts really at the service of, of whatever he wants to do. He uses it when he sees fit. His great friend Chet Baker, who today has one of the greatest cult followings, 
And Chet was backstage all the time, and I'd see him, and I'd say, hey, Chet, come on the show. And, uh, no, I'm just waiting for Jack. We're going out in the town. I thought, mm -hmm. He gets about the best sound of any trumpet player I know, and, uh, you know, had the talent that... I've got some albums that show... And when he was a kid, he was just incredibly great. <laughs> I don't know why he defers to Chet. I don't know. There's a man who totally wasted his life. So I think he was in Chet's shadow for a long time, uh, which is unfortunate because Jack is uh, every bit of good a good musician. In fact, in many ways, much better musician, I think. I mean, Jack's still here and still improving. Uh, Chet, unfortunately, is a different story. My mother bought me an Olds for $100, and I had that for a long time. Chetty and I both played a Bach 6 mouthpiece. I did it mainly because Chetty was doing it. Now I play a Bach 10 and a half C, and I use a big, extra-large bore trumpet. And when you change the trumpet, and it'll seem like, well, listen, I can do it better on this one. And then after you get used to it, it's just as hard as the other one. I'm not a psychoanalyst, but... I think he, d he lacks a lot of confidence in his own abilities. He's still taking lessons. I know he plays all day, every day. He practices constantly. I mean, he's the eternal student. We made a trip to Japan with Mel Tome, but all the way over flying, uh, he was in the John Locke playing with his music, practicing. On the bus in Japan, or in his hotel room, you'd pass his room at all times when he wasn't, uh, you know, traveling or eating or, or on, the, on the gig. He'd be practicing, always. The one and only Jack Shelton. Working on the job isn't enough. I have to practice to get ready for the job, and I learned this from you on. And my trumpet teacher, the guy that taught me everything that I know, and I noticed tonight it's not quite enough. <laughs> you on Racy, right there, the world's greatest trumpet player. He didn't practice. He wanted to play just enough of the job to keep going, and that happened to a lot of good trumpet players. They only play up to the job and they're a half inch from chaos by doing that. He listens to me play and he tells me just what to do. He doesn't like to warm up. He just wants to play starting off. That feels good to him. So we'll start off first by playing scales. Now hold the note, hold it longer. Now move the air column inside your mouth so it's a clear sound. Okay, it's clear. Now make the next note clear. Next note. Now play those three notes so they're all clear. Okay, you did play them. Now play the scale again. No, it wasn't clear. Do it again, Jack. No, it wasn't clear. Do it again. Now play two octaves. Play an octave higher. Do the same thing. Now put both octaves together. Okay? Now make that high C graceful. Every note graceful. Make the notes sound closer together. They sound too far apart, Jack. Make them sound so graceful. So do it again. No, the D flat wasn't graceful. Don't hit the first note so hard. Be graceful about it, Jack. Don't change the air tone to make a bad tone. Change the air tone to make a good tone. Hold the note. Hold the note. Hope for a long time, though. That good? Pretty good, Jack. Pretty good. you got to be a great athlete because the muscle is so small for the trouble to hear that they deteriorate like the rest of your body. Well, pain, I think you have to like the pain maybe a little bit, because it is painful, and you get sores on your lip. You never know, like wisdom teeth or jaw or, or your stomach or your hips or all the things that can go wrong just a little bit and tinker with the trumpet playing. You know, it's not just about sitting at the piano in your hands or your shoulders or something. There's all this other mechanism that can go wrong. So if you're able to really uh, still play in your 70s and 80s, then I think that, that that's the victory won. Because the trumpet takes players down at an early age. This thing is the coil of torture, as I call it, well, is a very difficult instrument. There's a lot of back pressure. It's hard on the heart. It's hard on the lungs. Uh, you get herniated necks. You cut your lip. And so at 75, to be playing the way he's playing, he hasn't lost anything. Because I do enjoy a certain amount of suffering and wallowing in it. He's put a half an octave on his range you know, over the past 10 years. Um, stuff that he didn't have when he was younger. You know, he's just not uh, riding the rest of his career out on what he can do. Even though he could, he's so talented. He's already 
Jack Sheldon. I mean, what else does he need to do? But he's still trying to get better, and I think he'll do that to the day he dies. I knew, I know you aren't saying you were sharp, Jack. I was sharp. I know, I, I pulled it out a little bit, you know. That's the first thing he told me when my first lesson. He said, it would help a lot if you got in tune, Jack. He's ragging on himself about some little detail, you know. Uh, but he usually comes around, and I know he can hang on to it for a couple of days. I feel, you know, I've always felt like I was not good enough and was not as good as other people, I couldn't play as good as other people, couldn't sing as good as other people. And you try to build yourself up and, and when you get fired, you know, that just tears you right down. This happened to me with Barry Manilow. I don't care about Barry Manilow, Jack Sheldon is better at what he does than Barry Manilow will be in 10 lifetimes. Let's get that part clear. But, you know, fuck him, you know, because they, they do it, I don't know who played on it, but it wasn't me, and so he didn't get what I can do, you know, so. Jack's shy. He's very shy. But as artists, we wonder sometimes if people really like us or do they only like what we do. And then uh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm so awful. My whole self-esteem goes down. I'm, what am I doing this? I can't sing, I can't play, I can't do anything, you know, and I get negative and it's, it's awful. I think he just wants to get on to a place as we all do where we can play. He's just listening so intently. I mean, I, he hears everything. He hears every note. And uh, there's that moment when it's clicking, and you know it's clicking, and you look up at Jack, and he's just got this sort of look like he's just letting it flow right through him. And then I figured that's when we hit the mark. Despite the fact that he seems like this kind of, you know, comedic, character. There's a standard that Jack set, and I know that everybody in my band thinks about it all the time. He plays the melody, he darts away from it, he, he'll play some lines, then you pick up the slack. He's like one of these skiers that's not afraid to go down the, the slope. It's real um, kind of almost uh, on the seat of your pants playing, you know. When he attacks something, boy, he's fearless. He's very demanding when it comes to the rhythm section. And when you show up at a Jack Sheldon gig, you have to have your game face on. You're ready to play. Like strong players that, that play the time very precisely and, and harmonically and, and outline the tune for him so that he doesn't have to think about what he's playing. We can all play. But why, when he plays a C natural, why don't we sound like that? Because everybody's got a C natural on their instrument, but he can play that note and just in your heart melts. There are so many fantastic trumpet players throughout the world in all different kinds of music, jazz, classical, whatever it is, that don't sound unique. But the trumpet players that sound unique, you can count on one hand, and Jack is in that league. Jack would sometimes uh, send a sub. <laughs> Jack would sometimes send a sub to the gig who would play the, 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 par the parts in the trumpet section. And then when it was Jack's turn to be featured, he would come out of the audience and hold forth for about 20 minutes and do his stuff and he'd go off. And then the sub would come back on again. He'd send a sub to his own gig and he'd come to the gig, you know. Doesn't Merv Griffin pay Jack Sheldon? And I said, well, what are they saying? He is down in front of the music center in Los Angeles and he's playing as the people leave the theater. Yeah, I said, Jack Sheldon? Our Jack? Yeah, he's down there doing that. So uh, I saw him a couple of days later and I said, Jack, what are you doing? You're down there with a tin cup playing your horn all by yourself? Well, oh, man, but that's, you see, that's the only time I can play for me. Jack to me feels like an old timer, you know, he is. No, but he feels like a throwback, you know? He's like those guys I grew up with. I mean, he's like Jimmy McPartland or uh, Billy Butterfield. He's like those guys. Wild Bill Davison. Too few jazz players 
believe as Jack believes that it's important and vital to touch people, to move people physically. If you cannot play time so that it communicates physically with somebody, you're not doing it right. Well, he's the icon of somebody who speaks, sings, and plays from the heart. The thing that'll get me out of my house to go anywhere is a virtual zone. I'm a virtual zone lunatic. So when I find somebody who's great at what they do, better than anybody else, that's what attracts me. Nobody is like him. But the other thing about Jack is, as he gets older, he gets to be a better singer. And I think he sings great, and I love to listen to him sing. Yeah, well, I sang in college, and uh, I remember the bass player said, oh, man, when did you, what are you doing? So I didn't sing for a while. It's soulful. It's, uh, you know, he's got a great character in his voice. It's a little raspy. There's a lot of, there's a lot of booze and smoke, nightclubs in that voice, a lot of the road in his voice. And it, you know, when, he's, um, when he sings like, don't worry about me, is an actor in them too that way. Don't worry about me. I'll get along. Forget about me. Be happy, my love. Let's say that our little show is over and so the story ends. Let's just call it a day, a sensible way. And still be friends. Look out for yourself. Should be the rule. When I do a song, I do interpret the words from my life and all very, uh, you know, emotionally. Yeah, but I try to keep in tune and try to make a good sound too. So it's a, you have to think of both ways. Jack sings so well. I mean, vocally they aren't perfect notes, but there is no not recognizing Jack's sound. He has his own sound and you can't say, oh, that's somebody else because it's Jack. I think one of the amazing things is how endearing uh, intent can be. I've sang uh, with um, 
never with Frank Sinatra, but with Tony Bennett and Ray Charles, and I, and I sing with those guys, and I think, well, I got my thing too, and you know, it's uh, it's good too, you know. And this, I think, this saves us to keep when we're playing terrible. I mean, I know I sound like a chicken a lot of times, you know, squawking, but uh, you keep thinking, I got something down there, you know. I think it's the human condition. I love Jack singing. Because I always say that my rules about great singing are, you can't make me nervous, and you have to be in tune. And Jack is perfect in both of those areas. He's got that great vibe to his voice, but he never sacrifices pitch in order to do his vibe. And um, he's got great time. I think he's a, a really underappreciated singer. I love Jack singing, and I always have. He plays Don't Worry About Me, and just love that. If you can forget <laughs> Don't He hasn't got the kind of a voice you'd equate with great ballad singers or, you know, com maybe a comedy singer like uh, Johnny Mercer, who never considered himself a great singer, but he's a wonderful singer on his own songs. Yo, mama don't wear no drums. I seen her when she pulled them on. She hung them upside the wall. She said it was Santa Claus. Mama don't wear no drawers. I seen her when she pulled them on. She hung them upside the wall. She said it was Santa Claus, and it just won't do. Well, I'm going down the river on a freight train, leaving tonight. Yes, I'm going down the river just to check up and see that everything's all right. Don't get busy, hot mama, just because I'm out of sight. Well, I'm a gambling man, but win or lose, you got to pay those dues. Win or lose, you got to pay them dues. If I ever lose you, hot mama, ooh, bad news. He is great because he has a, 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 a tone that's not, it's not, you know, it's not refined. He sings, when your heart is in your sleeve and you want to leave, then everybody, oh yeah. And it's effortless. When you see him in a club, he's wonderful in a club, he will always pick somebody up and do a number with them. Well, that was the thing. I never would sing in front of people. I was scared to death to sing in front of people. It was unthinkable. I was writing songs, but they were all for other people to sing. And if I sang them, it was only for demonstration purposes. So Jack, we'd be at a gig like at Dottie's, and Jack would, would say, get up to the microphone, he'd say, now Dave first we're going to sing his latest song. And I said, wait a minute, Jack, what are you doing to me? And he says, G came over to my house today, and he played it for me, and it's great. Go ahead, play it, Dave, and sing it. So I'd have to sing it. And then I, I got a nice hand and I thought, hey, this feels good. I kind of thought twice about singing after that. I took my baby to the circus to see what we could see. Yes, I took my baby to the circus to see what we could see. But when my baby saw what the elephant had, she didn't want to go home with me. And you're so beautiful, but you're going to die someday. Yes, you so beautiful, but you're gonna die someday. All I wanna do is get a little before you pass away. I'm respectable every other day of the week. Yes, I'm respectable every other day of the week. But on Friday, I turn into a free, freaky Friday. Come but one day a week. 
come back one day a week. You gotta watch out, baby, or you could turn into a free. But Jack never scats, which I really love. I mean, I'm glad, I don't like hearing people scat. Uh, I don't like scat singing. Maybe that's my problem. I guess we're both at the stage of life where you have to have a few laughs and if the audience isn't quite with you on that one, you, you, they'll forgive you. I grew up watching him on uh, the Saturday morning uh, Schoolhouse Rock thing. Yeah, um, I watch those things every Saturday. And uh, somebody told me that the guy who did the voice of those things was in L.A. when I moved out here. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. Conjunction, junction, how's that function? I got three favorite cars that get most of my job done. Conjunction, junction, what's their function? I got and, button, or. They'll get you pretty far. When we made Conjunction Junction, it was me and Teddy Edwards and Nick Ciroli and Leroy Vinegar and Bob Duro played the piano. That's a jazz band. Milk and honey, bread and butter, peas and rice. Hey, that's nice. Dirty butt, happy digging and scratching, losing your shoe and a button or two. He's poor but honest, sad but true. Boo -hoo -hoo -hoo. I was working with Jack all the time and listening to him sing. So when Bob Doro asked me to contribute to the uh, Schoolhouse Rock thing and they assigned me the, the assignment of uh, how a bill becomes a law in Congress, it's got to be Sheldon. It's got to be Jack Sheldon. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. I was writing everything for Jack to sing. This was a period of a few months. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill, yes, I'm only a bill, and I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be a law. How I hope and pray that they will, but today I am still just a bill. And it was jazz. It was really not nothing to do with rock. It was always jazz. But we said rock and roll, so everybody loved it for rock and roll. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be a law, the president can still say no? And you know that the, the, the young boy, well, that little kid is Jack Jr., John Sheldon Jr., Jack's son. That's a little bit of schoolhouse rock trivia. He signed your bill, now you're a law. Oh, yes! Why would Jack Sheldon play at the Money Tree, play at Jack's in Glendale, where by the time we clear up our bar tab, you know, we've come up in the red every time. <laughs> um, to play is to live. And if you've got a night and you have a chance to be out and playing anywhere, why would you be at home? Why would you be at home and not playing? You know, when you're playing in a little place and there's only two people, but you don't have any nerves about it. There's a certain amount of nervousness that comes with the places like the Hollywood Bowl and the Carnegie Hall. I, I love the excitement of being nervous and your legs shaking and trying to control yourself. And I'd love to be in Carnegie Hall every night and the Hollywood Bowl and have that audience. When we did the show like jazz, um, we did it at the Mark Taper Forum and we had full house every night. I think it was about 800 people. And there was a thrill of working for those people and they were loving it. That was just almost as good as sex. When you're in a show, you have to do the same thing. Not, I'm not talking about the jazz end of it, but, or how to sing or whatever. But if you have lines, 
you have to, those lines are written and they can't change. Uh, that has to do with timing, that has to do with cueing other people. Gordon Davidson was directing, Cy Coleman was directing, Larry Gelbart was directing, and it would drive you crazy. That's a lot of directors there. You know, they would conflict and they would tell you different stuff, so finally, it drove me nuts, you know, so I just started doing my own act. Of course, I have more sense, but... The performer wants more freedom to interpret those songs, but the songwriter wants what he wrote to get across to the audience. So that's always a conflict. That was hard for him. Discipline was hard for him. They did not see eye to eye, and, and understandably so. I mean, you have the people with the show mentality who just kind of wanted to create this product and, and put it out there and have it be the same thing every night. But unfortunately, the show was about jazz, which is never the same every night. And you have Jack Sheldon, who was just completely off the hook at any moment. He was the hit of the show, and it infuriated all those producers. And Jack does not like to read the script. Jack does not like to do the script. He walked out on the stage, and he would ad lib. The night I went, Mer Merv's here, and I have to. And I'm going, oh, Jack, I said, there are lines in. There are definite lines in a Broadway show, and you're not really supposed to cross over. Oh, fuck them. <laughs> there were about three big nights where the line was crossed by several miles. Jeez, this is not a Broadway show. This is a variety show for Jack. And of course, the audience adored him. So uh, it was a, a recipe for disaster in terms of clashing of, of the titans who were involved, but it was great fun watching. You hire Jack, you take your chances. I used to love to drink. I like to drink 151 rum. Because, yes, there's another guy I like to drink. With that, you know, you usually don't have to go out later and get another bottle. I'm my own worst enemy. I like Jack Daniels and black cigarettes. I like to face worrisome women, all I can get. I'm out to get me, but I ain't got me yet. I'm my own worst enemy. It took me 30 years to get a year sober. But I mean, finally I did get, no, but I, was, I knew I had a problem. More, more other people knew at first. I never connected any of the problems I was having with, uh, with drinking. But I notice now, since I got sober, I haven't been arrested since 1985. Life is tempting. You know, I tried not to preach to him or anything, because he was funny when he was loaded. I used to love it. I remember him telling me once, I can't do this much longer because I'm out of control. I think that he thought that if he didn't straighten out physically, that he would divest himself of his abilities, which is enough to frighten any serious musician to death. Jack, in his younger days, had some, he was a bad boy. So, you know, when you're, when you're going through that stage, you don't get called. Trumpet players have to keep everything firm. But it got so that uh, he would have one glass of wine and his, his whole top lip would just relax and droop down. The trumpet really doesn't care if you've got like lots of flights or you've been out late the night before or something like that. It will shut you down. When you're an alcoholic, you don't hear things until you hear them. But then eventually something will happen and you see these things. I finally said, this is all caused by drinking, you know, and uh, then I quit drinking. But I was lucky, I was one of the lucky ones, because I, I, like Chetty, I'm sure he would have liked to have had a different life, you know, than that junky life. I used to love to smoke pot, and not the kind of pot you get here in the bathroom at the Beverly Hills. But uh, this was grown on Merv Griffin's farm in Carmel. He didn't know about it. I just would drop the seeds there when I was going by. It was real dark and sticky and pungent. You'd take one puff, you'd be shy and hungry. He was a troubled guy in those days. And uh, 
funny and, uh, and, and brilliant, but uh, you know, he was suffering. And I loved cocaine. I loved to have cocaine. I got the best cocaine. It used to be pharmaceutical coke. You take one sniff of it and you see a flock of geese flying through the room. You never quite catch it. One time at Caesar's Palace, I called the room clerk and said, there's a flock of geese in my room. He says, you got any left? I think he realized that if he wanted to stay with us, you know, and not have one of those awful deaths because of drugs, that when he decided to go, go sober, it wasn't a big announcement. He just said in passing, you know, I'm sober now. But I never knew if he was on anything the whole time I was working with him. He was just Jack. He wasn't around. And he told me this, that he would go other places, you know. But I don't remember him at home drinking even. I took the whole club to my house at two o'clock, you know. And I was married at the time, and uh, so we have a, started having a party, and I had kids and the thing, and my wife woke up, and somehow she didn't want to go along with it, and... Uh, <laughs> he wants to be forgiven, I think, by himself. Forgive himself for being a, a poor example for his kids. And we've talked about that. My dad got sober, and I loved that. I used to go to the meetings with him. And wash the dishes in the kitchen, you know, in the little AA kitchen. I joined Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and Overeaters Anonymous. They told me that uh, you just, you know, these things were diseases. I was glad to hear that because I thought I was just having fun. <laughs> so I had to give up all these things because the human body can only stay loaded for 12 days. Then you have this terrible coming down thing. So I turned my life over to the care of God and. I'm not that really that happy with the way he's running. I like sugar and grease and fat. I love being a hip cat. The devil is my closest personal friend. He says I find jacket. Don't worry about the Actually, I don't like to fly that much. I don't think that little oxygen mask can save my life. A little orange rubber cup connected to a bag full of nothing. I don't even think it's oxygen. I think it's there to muffle the screams. No, Torme, he let me open the show at the Sahara. You know, and I had no idea. I wanted to be funny, but I had no act, and I didn't know any jokes or anything. And I would be talking and Mel would say, Jack, you gotta go a little faster. And I said, well, I know if I talk long enough, I can get a laugh. And he says, yeah, we don't have that much time. One time I woke up with a fully clothed sheep and it was wearing an engagement ring. No telling what I told that sheep. And I started looking for material, started writing material and stealing material. I was working on this really dark kind of piece of material that was really best used over the phone to people that you trusted. But it was nothing I was ever going to perform. And I told it to him, and he was hysterical. Now, it's about uh, the former coroner of L.A. You can't tell me that when, you know, certain movie stars came through on the slab, he didn't go, everybody out, everybody out, and, you know. I saw Jack Sheldon and Ross Tompkins. They were playing up on uh, Riverside Drive and the place, the money tree. So I said, hey, there's Jack Sheldon's playing there. I said, sweetheart, I'm gonna take you in to see this guy. And he goes, hey, I did your uh, Noguchi piece. Uh, <laughs> and Clint Eastwood thought it was hilarious. I said, what? I can't use the language he was using, but it was, it was a little, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was tough for me to explain on the first or second date. What are you doing? Yeah, I did it at the club. I got up and I said, everybody, you know, I told them, but you know, you can't tell when this guy wasn't a necro. And, it goes on and on and on. And Clint Eastwood came back and said, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. He goes, yeah, man, well, it's not mine, it's Billy Crystal's. And I go, I don't want Clint Eastwood to think that I'm doing this kind of filthy crap, you know? He singled me out of the audience and started saying uh, that how, uh, about talking about Madison County and uh, insinuating that uh, I was um, frolicking with uh, Meryl Streep on the floor and things like that, which weren't really in the picture. And he's back over in the back with Meryl Streep there. They're on the other thing. <laughs> Uh, Meryl's under the table. And I said, man, don't use my, it's not even my stuff. 
You know, it's just I was telling you something, you know, that I was thinking about. I wouldn't do it. I want you to do it. You know, I'm not writing for you. I took him to the actor studio, which is a very serious place. One time uh, I did a scene for Lee Strasberg with Mike Conrad. He was a good actor. Lee Strasberg said, uh, it looked like you were acting. And I said, thanks. He said, no, that's not what I mean. I, I want you to not to look like you're acting. So the next time I did a scene for him, I did Hamlet. I did this scene where they get the skull. He handed me the skull. I had to leave. I said, what the hell is this? He said, Jack, get out. <laughs> he never came back. <laughs> I think it intimidated him. One year, there was a new show coming up called Run, Buddy, Run, about a guy on the lamb and starred a guy I'd never heard of named Jack Sheldon. And it didn't last very long, but it was there. And he was sort of like, um, like a soft Steve McQueen, you know? He was kind of cool. He was... He was funny and uh, a little bit of uh, Marty Milner in him. I think my, the first memory I have was of that show Run Buddy Run. He broke both arms and broke a leg and sprained something. And I remember helping him because I was the pet, you know. My favorite souvenir of a TV series, it's the comic book version of Run Buddy Run. Uh, and then I'd see him on Merv. It's the Merv Griffin Show! I said, who's this guy? How funny is this guy? I said, that's Buddy. That's Buddy from Run, Buddy, Run. And he was always funny. What's that? You say you're going to change the color of your hair to purple. No, don't do it. I like you the way you look now. You say you're going to wear a dark collar on your neck with them studs sticking out. I don't want that. You're going punk on me. I first, like so many people, heard of Jack when he, you know, had his stint on the Merv Griffin show. And so, as a young trumpet player, to turn on the TV and the power of television is so interesting, especially to young people that want to become something. And so you not only got to hear his personality go through the instrument, but you get to see and feel his personality when he opens his mouth and speaks. And the audience just loved him. They couldn't get enough. However, our affiliated stations were constantly threatening to pull the show on a kind of jack. Well, Merv, these uniforms, it gets worse and Where's worse. Where's your belt? <laughs> I couldn't afford a belt. Ah, Where's I'm the... supposed to be buying the band belts now? Stand up, Chris. Were you ever that size? No, I have a lot more in my jeans than Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Merv was a sort of staid guy and, and um, great musician, but then we talked to Jack. Jack was like from out of space. When he'd be working on the Merv Griffin show, he'd come back and he'd say, I'd say, what happened? He says, well, Merv and I are on the outs right now. And I'd say, why is that? And he'd say, well, I, I went too far. I won't be kidding, Jack. Say another word. No, don't, no, don't, 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 don't. He'll get us in trouble. He called me up on a Monday morning. He said, Mort, I want to apologize <laughs> for the way I'm going to act this week. But there was a lot of Jack on the cutting room floor because uh, he has never self-censored himself. And that's, you know, he's Peck's bad boy. Well, my first and last impression of Jack Sheldon is that he's one of the funniest guys I've ever known. I mean, he is one funny SOB. I can't see that good, so I would, you know, flirt with girls in the audience and I really didn't know what they look like. But I saw this one girl one time, had a beautiful blue dress and I was like, So after the show, she came up to my room. She was about 85 years old. <laughs> but she'd come all the way up there. <laughs> so we did it standing up. We got through and she said, oh, you didn't even mess up my hair. <laughs> oh, I love to be funny. And I think once you get a laugh, you do become a laugh whore. You know, you want that laugh at any price. About 11.30, my values change. <laughs> Jack kind of starts off the evening testing the waters to see what's going to sink and what's going <laughs> to swim. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've never had a... Well, I had one homosexual experience. But I needed the ride. Well, two, I had to get back. And then he told a story about his father, who he said was a contortionist. He said until one day, sadly, he
he had a heart attack on stage and died in his own arms. We played at Eagle Rock High School one time, and the first thing he said on the microphone is, I love the student body. I mean, you'd, there'd be heart attacks, and the wheelchairs would tip over. <laughs> This looks painful. <laughs> but I'm sure if you practice with it a while, you'll be able to... My whole life I've been thinking I was dirty. I don't know where anybody got that idea, but... I always thought when you're on the road and it's... Like the first guy that puts hair on the end of the trumpet will make a fortune. <laughs> hey. Don't do that. No, that's terrible, isn't it? That's awful. If I didn't get laughs, I would get mad at the audience. And I think every comic goes through that. And then you get worse and worse, you know, and you get a whole fight going with the audience. But a real good comic will come out and they won't be going over that good at first. And then they'll just keep plugging away and keep going and keep loving the audience. And then finally they are got everybody screaming. If it's sexual or about a nun or about a about the Pope or about a priest or whatever, something over the line, he absolutely will do it in a way where you go, four stars, pa, 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 because he did it Jack Sheldon's way. And Jack Sheldon's way is always kind, good, clever, and he, and he lets you come back to your, your original sitting position without going, ooh. Well, he goes a little too far sometimes, yeah, I mean. <laughs> I remember actually getting up and walking off the bandstand. It's Dante's. I don't want to be part of this. You know, I didn't say that to anybody, but I just left. Went to the bar until he was finished. I didn't want to be up there. Well, you know, he's very uh, sexist. Every comic wishes he'd played the trumpet. <laughs> or had something else to go to. Besides, uh, what else? So what's in the news? It's him as much as, as music, and it's the same. So he's telling a joke or he's playing a solo. It's the same thing for him. Lenny Bruce used to always think of himself as a jazz musician, and he loved musicians. He wanted to be around jazz, and he thought that the microphone was his horn. You know, people used to get turned off because he couldn't resist being dirty. But Jack, is no, as far as I know, he and Joe Maney, who was a saxophone player, they were a team, and they always opened for Lenny Bruce because they were very funny. They had no shame. What a great night. Frank Marshall is here. My best friend in life was Jack Marshall, his father, the funniest guy I've ever known in my life, Jack Marshall. My dad and he became best friends right away. They sort of shared an exotic sense of humor. When they traveled together, things got pretty crazy. The whole band rented cars, and they had to, sort of a contest is probably not a good thing to say, but. Uh, the contest was uh, who could do the most damage to the rental car by the time they got back to the airport. Jack Sheldon was sort of very creative in his damage to the car. I said, Jack, you can't work dirty. We played Disneyland for a week, so we had an act workout. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to listen to Jack Sheldon sing and play. Come on down, Jack. And he come down, and half the audience will run right off to the stage. He said, oh, it's so nice being here in Disneyland with Minnie and Mickey Mouse. Music, Moni said Mickey Mouse went right into the music. That's as far as his speech went. Because with Jack, he's liable to start talking about Minnie and Mickey Mouse. Who knows what he's gonna say about them? I prefer to hear him play than to, to tell dirty jokes. What did you like about me, Jackie? Your lip syncing. <laughs> How about the lips? And the sink is good too. <laughs> I think a lot of people think that being funny or having a sense of humor and playing serious music are mutually exclusive, and they're certainly not, because Jack plays the most beautiful trumpet of anybody I can think of. They like it if you just do one thing, and they like it if you suffer. Yeah, you're too funny, you're not serious. Not a serious musician, whatever the hell that means. Jack. Yes. <laughs> you know, Yes. You've done so much for me. The diets you've given me over the They're years. They're working, too. You're, it's working great. You're just dropping so the I'm weight on, off. Yeah. I'm on the latest one. What is that latest one, that pill you gave me? It's the Quaalude diet. Quaalude. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell them, tell them what it does. Well, most of the food falls out of your mouth. That's right. 
Everyone gets impatient with Jack. Musicians have become, I've seen musicians become impatient with him. But at the same time, everybody forgives him. It's unanimous. The world forgives him, you know. If you look in his eyes, you can see a wealth of experience. All of the tragic aspects of Jack's life are present in his, in his playing and in, and in his comedy. It kind of exudes from his pores. Where do you start? How do you separate the present from the past? How do you deal with all the things you thought would last? That didn't last With bits of memory scattered here and there I look around and don't know where to start Which books are yours? Which tapes and dreams belong to you? And which are mine? Our lives are tangled like the branches of a vine that intertwine. They don't talk. So many and my parents do not talk to each other since they broke up. Patty was a sweet little girl. Didn't seem to fit the jazz scene that uh, Jack was into. We have a relationship with her and the relationship with him. And she's married. She's happily married. She's. My dad never married again. He's married to the trumpet. He likes it best of all. And it hurt him with his family. Well, I missed the music when he was gone and there was no more music. A moment in what might have been. Where do you start? Jack's life has just been a medley of tragedies. His mother who was killed by a car on Hollywood Boulevard. Well, she always said, don't worry about that. I'm just, it's going to take a truck to kill me. Well, it did take a truck. <laughs> I mean, it took a truck. And I called my dad and I said, you know, Jen's been hit by a garbage truck. Once you get knocked over, you're just garbage. So you might as well be right there by the truck. And he is a polyanchi because he doesn't want to show that he has grief or that he hurts at times. He does hurt at times. It hurts badly at times. She was about 79. She was teaching, swimming, going strong. They took her in, and we went to go eat. Really good Mexican place down here at County. Anyway, so we go eat, and then uh, he dropped me back off, and he goes, why don't you call me and find out what's going on? He doesn't stick around. I said, Jack, when's the last time you went to a doctor? He said, whoa, I was a kid in Florida. I said, Jack, that's 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, that's when I went. And I said, Jack, go make an appointment and take a physical. It's terrifying at first to hear that word, cancer. When I first got it, I started crying on the parking lot when the guy told me. I wanted to live. I wanted to keep playing and, you know, do stuff that I hadn't done yet. I still want to get good on the trumpet. Uh, when Jack's son Kevin passed away, um, I talked to Jack a little bit about it, but he didn't open up too much. Yeah, I remember him saying, I don't think Kevin's going to make it. Kevin was in a place they couldn't operate, and then it spread through his body, you know, and it was just, and he was also, he was a heavy drinker. When you go out and you party all the time, you know, there's some things that go along with that. Kevin was drinking a fifth a day, so he didn't have any kind of immune system. Somebody might have said, oh gosh, that's such a terrible thing that's happened, as for instance with Jack's son. Uh, Geez, didn't you want to take a couple of nights off, you know? And they're like, no, no, the music is the music is the thing that's keeping me going, you know? And Jack is definitely like that, definitely. I mean, what I love about Jack is that he does, in this sort of quirky way, have a sense of family, though, and the family is, is very important to him. He adores his children. Uh, 
and he worries about them and uh, and it probably was a terrible father but I, had I been one of the kids I sure would have laughed all the time I thought he was a great father I really do but he does tell me you're in denial Jess <laughs> so I don't know Here's one champion, and what's your name, honey? Silly Sheldon. He's lost. You know, his daughter got killed in a plane crash. The one that was down in Mexico and for a, a drug problem. And I just had that, I had a funny feeling. I had a very strange feeling that she wasn't going to be back. And we were in New York playing in, uh, at Lincoln Center. And... Uh, I had to call Jack and go over and see him and just say, Jack, well, he just, if the word can be uh, defined, freaked. He never referred to any of the tragedies. They were tragedies that would kill a guy, I would think. I have never seen the unhappiness of Jack, if there is unhappiness, and there has to be with those tragedies. But. As a friend of his, he doesn't want you to share those with him, so he um, he does it all on the stage. I think I learned that too. Is that the if the show always goes on? a little time to cry or do you close your eyes and kiss it all goodbye I guess you try and though I don't know where and don't know when I'll find myself in love again I promise there will always be a little place no one will see Stays in love with you. Alan and Marilyn Bergman. Oh, so good. And a great song. Johnny Mandel. Singers used to, like Piggy Lee or somebody like that, be making a record and they'd say, I want Jack Sheldon to play the trumpet obligato. Edison were the obligato kings. They played behind all these great singers on the records. I remember one time having Hank Mancini on the show, and I said to him, uh, have you used Jack? Just kidding, hoping he would say no. I'm not gonna put him in my orchestra. He's a troublemaker. And Hank said, of course. If I'm underscoring a film, he said, and I have a, a bedroom scene or anything, I only use the trumpet of Jack Sheldon because there's no sexier player in uh, music. To really play a ballad with kind of nobility and passion and connection with an audience uh, is, is, is a very, very tough thing to do. The Sandpiper theme, it's the first time I really heard this trumpet player. And I thought it was brilliant. 
And I think, you know, you ask people, who was playing the trumpet? Nobody seemed to have known that that's one and the same, Jack Sheldon playing trumpet, because they always knew him as a comedic guy. What is Jack worth doing the melody of your main title? Ask John Mandel about the shadow of your smile. It's like indelible. The movie itself was one of the most beautiful mu movies, not as far as the story, the script, or any of the, anything like that, but it was all shot in Big Sur. So what I did was decided to write the scenery, and I needed a solo voice that would be like, oh, a seagull or any of the birds that are soaring all up above this. And Jack just seemed like uh, the perfect candidate for that. I told Johnny Mandel to write it in F so I could be down low and nice and easy, you know, and he wrote it in uh, D, which is a little higher. He did a gorgeous job on it, and I know it wasn't an easy job to do. Well, you're in for a great treat tonight. Here's the man himself, the man behind it all, dressed in Orson Welles' rehearsal clothes, <laughs> Jack Sheldon. <laughs> Jack, you've never been honored before. Think about tonight. This Thank is you, even Leonard. more painful than uh, That's Diane's. It. I'll, God. Let, I'll let you try it first, Bert. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know, he's just such a giant in the history of music, and, and he really hasn't been recognized as much as I think he should be. Has he got the public recognition that he deserves? No. Um, does he want it? I'm not sure. Uh, is he willing to play the game to get to that point? No. Not for the greatness of Jack has he ever been recognized by uh, the masses for what he does great. To have that back and forth that he had with Merv, that's one thing, but when musicians all love that same person and they talk about them and they they respect them then that's very rare uh, to say anybody is better would it be a simple matter of taste what story do i have about jack that no one else has well, i can't tell that one <laughs> i think that people underestimate how tremendously serious he is as a musician and uh, we we love him I have uh, many favorite Jack stories, but you can't tell any of them, unfortunately. And this, this is going to be some sort of porno show that's going to be shown in Hong Kong or something. I could tell you the story, but like you're not going to be able to use it. <laughs> I'll tell you the, oh, I'll tell you the joke, but it'll be off camera. Go ahead. Not that I can think of right now that we could be repeated. I get a little choked up because it's nice to be able to tell somebody how much I love them this way because I could never tell him personally. 
I just like being around him. I love, I really do like being around him and I loved him and I love him and connection there, you know. I'm always getting better, you know, but it's very slow. If I keep learning at the rate I am now, I figured out I don't quite have time to figure things out. It had to be you. It had to be you. I wandered around and finally found the somebody who could make me be true. Just to be sad, thinking of you. Some others I've seen might never be me. I might never be cross or try to be boss, but they wouldn't do. thrill with all your faults I love you still it had to be you beautiful you it had to be you to be you I wandered around I know where it was I finally found the somebody who could make me be true could make me Just to be sad thinking of you. Some others I've seen might never be me. I might never be cross or try to be boss, but they wouldn't do. Cause 
Cause nobody else gives me a thrill And with all your faults, I love you still It had to be you Had to be you Thank you and good night. I got 49 women. I always need one more. Yes, I got 49 women, but I always need one more. If the right woman comes along, the other 49 can go. Let me be your little dog Till your big dog come Let me be your little dog Till your big dog come And when your big dog come Tell him what your little dog